This is the last photo ever taken of Abdi Nasser. Two days after he emailed it to his mother, he was dead. On the evening of April 20th, he ate dinner at Halima's kitchen. At about 8 o'clock, he phoned his mom, told her he was with a friend from Jamestown Crescent. I said, okay, take care, guys. Don't go outside. And they say, okay, until we take care of ourselves. By midnight, he was at his apartment. Looking back, Fadumo says there was something strange in her son's voice that night, an uneasiness. Me and mother, I feel like my son. He's not minister happy. I think he afraid. And I say, Abdul Nasser, when you come back, you say, Mama, I come back this week. That was the last thing he ever told her. What happened next is now at the heart of the RCMP's investigation. The police won't confirm anything, but the family tells us they've talked to that friend who returned with Abdi Nasser to his apartment that night. He tells them that what ended as a murder began as a robbery. There were three of them, according to the friend. They arrived in the early hours of the morning. Three people that he wasn't really close to. And they were probably planning on having a long night, and he wasn't having it. And his friend, his actual friend, said he was going to get, get some food. The friend left, and according to what he later told the family, Abdi Nasser went to bed. What follows is what Hamda has pieced together since. So I believe they woke him up, told him he had no money, probably buying himself time until the other until his other friend came back. So they said, if we don't eliminate him, then there's gonna be a lot of people after us. Several hours later, the friend returned. Abdi Nasser was on the bed, a bullet hole in his head. He called 911 and fled. That evening in Toronto, police arrived at Fadumo's house. And then they say, your son is passed away. They tell me that night. What did you think? I don't know. I was so shocked. Do you know what happened that night? I don't know. The time he talked to me, he's afraid to maybe someone he... Did he tell you he was afraid? He don't tell me like in... He said, Mom, I come back to you. I don't want to hear He said, I know my son, he have a problem that night. When we come back. We know the person that shot, that pulled the trigger. Government name and everything. crime scene, the place where Abdi Nasser Deary died, marked the fifth murder of a young Somali in Alberta in just seven months. Abdi Nasser's friend, Shukri. Were you surprised? I was. In a way. In a way, I was surprised. And in a way, I wasn't because that's how they, all the kids end up. You hear every day somebody's dead. Somebody got shot. And yet police seemed powerless to stop it. In large part, they said, because the community was unwilling to help. 
people want to know, they want to solve these things, right? The yep. police want it solved, the community wants it solved. Yep. Why, can't the, why can't the community share the information with the police now? This is where the term snitch comes in. In this world, to be a snitch is to make yourself a target, and you don't have to run with gangsters to get the point. It's like practically you're telling on somebody, that's what they're saying, that peer pressure. It doesn't matter how old you are or how old you are. They're afraid for their own lives. For Legitimately afraid? Should yeah. they be afraid? They are. That's the truth. Iman and Hoda are afraid, and that's what keeps them quiet even in Jamaica. They've sworn never to reveal the identity of the Toronto drug dealer who sent them here. So even though this man set you up and got you into this situation and has caused you all this trouble and grief, mm -hmm. you're, you're not prepared to, to tell the police who he is? I'm afraid. I'm you're afraid, afraid to tell the police? Yes, yeah, I'm afraid. Why? Because knowing that our, one of our loved ones died from something that we don't even know what he got himself into. And for us to say something and if something happened to us, I don't want to lose nobody in my family. And yet, despite all of that fear, Abdi Nasser's family has gone to the police with the information they received about his murder. We personally called them and said, we know the person that shot, that pulled the trigger, government name and everything. Well, how does anybody know who pulled the trigger? Because there were only three people there that night. There were no witnesses. Right. One of those three people talked. So everybody in the street knows. Everybody knows. Everybody knows who it was that Every was there that night, who it everybody was that knows. pulled the trigger. Even the police know. They have fingerprints. Nothing has been done. What reason do the police give for nothing we're being done? We're looking for more evidence. What more evidence do you need? The family says the key is to crack some of the young men Abdi Nasser was running with in the months before he died. We recently caught up with a couple of them in Fort McMurray as they pleaded guilty to unrelated counts of theft and assault. They wouldn't talk to us, nor would the Fort McMurray RCMP, not about Abdi Nasser, not about any of the murders they have so far failed to solve. There is a hostility that exists between the police and those communities. Abdi Fatah Warsami is a community activist in Abdi Nasser's old neighborhood. There is a perception within the uh, police force that if a kid or a person was dealing with drugs, then pretty much, you know, no matter cares. They deserve what, whatever yeah, happens. Exactly. Most of them were executed. They, they were killed in an you know, execution style. Uh, clearly, you know, I mean, the, the community, the, um, the, the parents of this young man, they, they deserve better answer than that. You know, police should do a better job than that. To some, Abdi Nasser Deary may be just one more dead would-be gangster. But he was also a son and a brother, and to this day, his family refuses to believe he was anything but the good kid they knew. I mean, look at Hamda. Let me just let me play devil's advocate here, you uh -huh. know. And I and I say this with the greatest respect. But he gets picked up with a bunch of guys and cocaine in January. Right. In the days before he dies, he shows up in Edmonton, comes in and out in a day. Now, you know, was he there to pick up drugs and take them back? Who knows. Rumors go around that he's got lots of money. These guys want to rob him, in, in your understanding of events, because rumor has it that he's got lots of money. If he'd just done a drug pickup, he probably did have lots of money. There's a logic there, right? That somebody who is completely dispassionate about this might put all of those things together, and in their mind they'd say, yeah, that's what he was doing. Of course that's what he was doing. Maybe if you didn't know him. If you didn't know him, then maybe. You would think like that, obviously. But if you personally know the person and you've been through thick and thin with this person, no. There's a little part in your mind that says maybe, maybe this good boy, he 
he's a good boy. I but but maybe he got involved with something bad. Yeah, he's a good boy. I cannot you know, friends. The problem is uh, if he don't do nothing wrong, friends they do something wrong and he's with them. That's the problem. Yeah. I don't know if, if it's an ignorance of what their children are really doing or just a, a willful blindness of what their children are doing, but invariably what you, the story you get from the family is, he was such a good boy. Well, this is where I say stop, you know, put stop off to, your, to your stability. You know, you need to wake up and smell the coffee. As tough as he is on the police, Warsami is just as hard on his own community. As an organizer who works with kids, he says parents have to start stepping up and getting involved with their children. Twenty years after they arrived in Canada, he says Somalis have to accept they're not in Somalia anymore. A lot of parents, fathers in particular, would love to <clears throat> pressure their sons to um, carry the uh, Somali culture mm -hmm. and not realizing these kids were born in this country. These kids are Canadians. We need to adopt the Canadian way of life. Which that means is, what? Which means being proactive, which means, you know, um, taking the matters in their own hands, you know, taking responsibility, you know, um, uh, making a difference in the lives of your child. On the outskirts of Edmonton, in what used to be a farmer's field, Abdi Nasser Diri is buried. In all, there are 18 graves of young Somali men, most of them from Toronto. Their families couldn't afford to fly them home. At one time, each represented the hope of a new generation of Canadians, but not one lived to be 30. Generations disintegrating bit by bit by bit, I believe so. I think most of the people that I know that were in our generation, most of them are gone. They're not here. They've left, they've they're emigrated? They're gone as in they're not alive. They're not here. They're dead. Yeah, and I know our parents been through a lot to bring us where we are right now. And my mom, Knowing that I put her through this, this is the worst thing I could ever put her through. My mom is going crazy back home. My dad, I don't know what to do. I hate this place. I just want to go home safe now. I hate this place. I wish I could go back in time and just say, you know what? Take her two tickets. I don't want nothing to do with you. A final note on our story tonight. Two weeks ago, Iman and Hoda were convicted on those drug smuggling charges. The Jamaican judge did not believe their claims that they had been duped. In December, they will be sentenced, and in the meantime, they have been returned to jail. As for Abdi Nasser's murder, police tell us their investigation continues, and we'll update you with any new information that we receive. The Fifth Estate will be right back. Welcome back to the Fifth Estate. For more about this or any story you see on the program, go to our website. It's at cbc.ca slash fifth. A look now at some stories we're working on. Next week, abuse and